Network Automation Nerds Podcast. Hello and welcome to Network Automation Nerds Podcast, a podcast about network automation, network engineering, Python, and a host of technology topics. I'm your host, Eric Cho. Today on the show, we'll be ta- we'll be talking to Anton Kaniluk, and I know I didn't get that last name right. So, Anton, can you help me out and say it the right way? Perfect. Hello, Eric. Hello, everyone. My name is Anton Kaniluk. Um, it's how it's pronounced in the English, obviously. It's not like typical English-speaking surname. So, let's probably put just Anton for the simplicity of everyone. <laughs> yes, I, I appreciate that. But at least you know now we know how to say it properly. I don't say it, but yeah. you know, Anton, it is. So. Anton is a author, open source project contributor, educator, blogger, and so much more. Uh, initially, we met over at the London uh, Network Automation Meetup, and I was impressed with all those projects that he was doing. So I'm interested in learning how he's handling all these projects, what he's up to, and I bet we could all learn a thing or two. So let's dive right in. Anton, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, hello, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it was a pleasure indeed to meet you on the Network Automation Meetup here in London and uh, uh, to also learn from you about the Python thing that you're doing. So, uh, uh, yeah, um, let's get started. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So before you know, we're diving into mm-hmm. all the cool things that you're doing, Anton, mm-hmm. and all the projects, and, and there are some impressive ones, I would say. But before we get into all of that, I, I'd like to just ask you, you know, how did you get into technology? What's your kind of an origin story? Okay. Uh, well, it was an interesting one. So when I was learning in school, I don't uh, really want to be a like technology guy. I was thinking probably I should go, you know, to learn for economics. Then I was thinking <laughs> I, I should be a builder. And when I was like uh, was a kid, I was really uh, working as a like builder help on the proper construction works, which is kind of fun. Um, but then I started looking, okay, uh, I'm generally quite pragmatic guy. And what like the profession that generally uh, work in across the globe, you know, and what the profession that would allow me uh, to not be bound to any particular uh, geographic location. I, I started thinking that probably if you are working with economics or, or, or law or any other kind of this science, you are bundled really to the region because each right. country has different law and regulation and others. Whereas technology, right. that's something that opens um, possibility to do pretty much everything because technology is technology, right? Packets are packets. And that's how I could start uh, studying this. Um, I was probably a bit lucky because uh, my older brother, who is a, a professional software developer and project manager with all his like, long experience, he was saying to me, look, there is a Cisco. They're doing some cool stuff. Okay, okay, let's take a look. And that's how I just, during uh, like my early years of the university, I get up with the Cisco CCNA, and they're like, oh, wow, it's indeed a very, very interesting world. And, you know, all the technology properly structured, really uh, framed in terms of the use cases. Uh, fine, way to go. And that's how I gradually start working into the networking area. Uh, and I think like for many other engineers worldwide, Cisco certification at that time was kind of, you know, entry ticket into the networking world. Uh, yep. Not only because everyone has Cisco. Cisco is not cheap and in many countries. Right? <laughs> no. But also from the technology perspective, from, from the way how they structure the knowledge, from the way how they present it and on the people. So it was very helpful for myself. Uh, when I was a student, I learned uh, a, a lot of things from CCNA. I passed CCNA, CCNP. Uh, CCD. So it was like starting really a lot because for me it was kind of very, very interesting. And uh, after that, um, I started working for one of the biggest telecommunication provider in the com- my original country in the Belarus, uh, where like the full Cisco house, cool. Like I already was well prepared for that, I thought. <laughs> so, but um, um, obviously, no, a lot of nice theoretical things was just the beginning. And I was very helpful, grateful for the team who was very helpful in order. Uh, to get impression of the real planning of the networks, like PM, PLS, data centers, operation, a lot of, you know, nice maintenance activities, learning this stuff. It was, this how I started working and then gradually, okay, so probably it's already interesting, already a lot, but probably I could go farther. Then I start, okay, probably I could move to another country and start working in another different country because packets are packets, right? 
Um, right. And that's how I appeared basically in the networking, then automation world afterwards, few years after that, where before it was mainstream, I was like started doing probably automation in 2016. So mm-hmm. when it was early, you know, stages of the Ansible, start doing the first steps in the automation, network automation specifically, what because it was by the time right. I was by the way. Yeah. And uh, now where I'm where I am, right? So writing the books and doing the automation, <laughs> which is quite an interesting and uh, never boring, at least for myself, um, uh, you know, area. You know, that's that's kind of interesting because a lot of people I see kind of like two. When I talk to people, there's two spectrums of uh, how they get into technology, right? So one of them is like, yeah, you know, my dad got me a uh, a computer when I was five and I wrote my first program at six and so so started a game company and sold my games at 12. And so that's that's one side. And then another is like me, who's like kind of afraid of technology for a long time and switch, mid, switch career midway. And, uh, you know, kind of it got that way, but you're kind of in between that you, you knew, uh, you were kind of interested in technology, but you started right away with network engineering in college and then just kind of went the Cisco route from there on. Yes, absolutely. Because, um, there, I mean, I get to use them into computers, well, like I, as you say, not like six, probably 10, but all my computer knowledge in time was like how to install the new video games and like start doing <laughs> games. Right. So it's not that kind of geek like writing all my games, but um, I, I was always interested in the how the technology is working at least on the like basic understanding level and uh, before starting understanding how the communication done between the computer systems people. Um, that was something quite uh, interesting in nature. I would say like nature of just curiosity and then apply that. Okay, probably people are talking, right? And uh, it was all the kind of the, the the internet grows. It was obviously after like nineties, late nineties, with the dot com boom and then crisis. But still, like at, at that time, the internet. It was obvious that internet as a platform uh, will be with us for. Ever, I don't know for for very long <laughs> period of time. Right. And also. Uh, all the services are gradually coming, like e-commerce, uh, like the, the first messengers and like the first video online calls. So this definitely was very, very impressive. And uh, I think in that I will probably never be a jobless in this. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's a that's a good point. So I think you're right. So the consistent theme, even, you know, however, whenever they started with technology in their life, the consistent theme is they've always been curious so the curiosity was like the main driver to whatever they do. And because the technology was so prevalent in our lives that eventually led them, led all of us into this path down, down the technology. But curiosity is kind of this mindset that drove all of us into technology. So, so if I take you back and also, you know, you brought up a good point about the, um, the dot com boom and then the the crash in the two thousands, right? So I was I was actually studying in college uh, during that time. I graduated right on two thousand, so oh, wow. it's like a few months before before I graduate. It's like everything blew up, and uh, I, I was hoping that I could move to Silicon Valley, but uh, but nobody was hiring. In fact, it was really depressing. It's like it's almost like the hangover from like a drunken party. <laughs> it's yeah, just like absolutely. nobody was hearing, but you're right also that, you know, it was obvious that even though, you know, the hype bubble had burst, but this thing is here to stay. So luckily uh, we all were in a, in a, in a field that was growing me. I was building broadband. So yeah. uh, networking broadband and that was the field still growing. So ho- So, you know, luckily I wasn't out of a job. But uh, but that was certainly a scary time. And, you know, when you say that, it just kind of brought back memories. Yes, absolutely. I was a time in, uh, yet in the school, so I, I haven't seen that much. But uh, even looking into the the past career, right, so we could see this fluctuation, they constantly go and there's some technologies coming that they happen. Same story like what is happening right now with the probably cryptocurrencies happening, happening <laughs> probably at some point. I don't know. It's still like growing. Maybe yeah. sometimes, who knows? But uh, with, with with all the things, but on the other hand, right? So the the industry revolution has happened multiple times right now. Yeah. Um, 
I was living a few years uh, ago in Germany and uh, what they were naming their new digital uh, governmental strategy the industry for the zero, like yeah. a new iteration in the development of the society, the economy, putting the things more in the digital way. It was linked a lot with introduction of 5G and other services where um, the processes uh, of standard manufacturing or any other economical activities gain more digitalized. So this trend, I think, um, it's just going in one direction. I, I don't see uh, how it could go backwards, to be honest, to, to, to get back to the paper. So um, it just matter probably on the different countries, different parts of the world, how quick it would be and how um, massive the impact uh, it is doing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. I mean, when when certain countries starts to uh, peg their national currency against, you know, crypto, I mean, this is not a show about crypto, but, yes. you know, that shows like that it has legs, right? Like it has some validity. And when, you know, your your um, I, retirement funds, which is tend to be conservative, um, starts to invest part of the portfolio into crypto, you know, it's 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 a legitimate investment asset, whether it's going to replace you know, your paper money, your credit card, that's yet to be seen. But it definitely is, you know, uh, like you said, the technology curve and it's so interesting. And that's what's keep uh, keep the things exciting, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully we wouldn't see uh, more crises or close <laughs> to big like it was before. And we certainly know the, the positive aspects of this growth, but you never know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, at least, I personally, and I think we're very really around the same age. So at least personally, we've seen, you know, kind of different bubbles burst, right? Like the dot-com bubble, the financial crisis. And uh, now we've kind of on the tail end of COVID. So it's almost like, okay, you know, what's next? <laughs> Bring it on, you know? But you know what's the interesting thing with the COVID? Uh, I think for everyone who is working in the technology area during the COVID, and especially for the company, I mean, counting company owners or, or, or businesses, a major stakeholder, this was a sort of um, like a holy grail. It's probably not right to say it speaking, but I know how many people have died and the suffering, how many fa families. But if you uh, think which role the technology has played, um, I think it, it's always it was very positive aspect because all the communications went on the online. They're, we were looking like how the... Uh, service providers who provide the wireless access, broadband access, uh, access um, was uh, just in the very you know short time period moder uh, modernizing their infrastructure. Where the whole world wanted to work from home, no one was prepared for that. Um, yeah. I was uh, also working in like one of the companies uh, with just seeing the massive growth of the traffic uh, yeah. in all the parts of the infrastructure. And uh, I think the good thing that in many cases the technology either quickly readapted. What was yeah. already ready. Um, uh, on the other hand, so we saw the significant growth of their e-commerce segments. All the sales went online, and for the companies who was already prepared, uh, obviously it was very nice time because just revenue was hot, like skyrocketing. The interesting thing, though, um, I have heard uh, opinion that probably once this is gone, people go back to the normality in terms of like shopping traditionally. But from what I see, it's not that happening that much. If you already get to use, you don't need, you know, to 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 have a carry back even to your car and then from car home and everyone delivering the stuff to your home. Well, it's probably not that bad, and you will continue doing things. Still, definitely, you will be going out and shopping somewhere. But for yeah. many things, you'll stick to that you already have learned in the past two years. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it, it's a it's adapt adaptability, right? So, I mean, um, if you think you know, going online in the last two years was hard. Imagine COVID happened before uh, broadband or before technology or before Zoom was around, it would be even harder. Um, and you brought up a good point about habit forming. You know, when when my, you know, 92 year old neighbor starts to shop online, it's a, it's, it's a progress, right? Like it shows that it has, the technology has reached a set of demographics and uh, there's no turning back on some of these um, stuff. But I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, I feel like this is an interesting topic. I might invite you back on, uh, <laughs> on just <laughs> okay, talking okay. about this, right? Because um, it's so very interesting. Like, you know, I was uh, looking at case studies and interesting about the backbone traffic growth 
uh, mm-hmm. as far as the peering exchange, how many traffic increase. Mm-hmm. Uh, that in itself is, I think, a, a great case study. So as as we get over the tail end of this, you know, we'll see more case studies, and we'll definitely have to talk. We'll, we'll set aside some time and definitely have to talk about these stuff that we're both uh, interested in from a technology perspective. Obviously, it's a serious matter for sure, um, but you know, we could always look at the technology perspective and uh, go from there. Yeah, hundred percent. Looking forward to. <laughs> all right these ideas just keep on generating um yes. but so going back to what we're talking about it, it's interesting that you mentioned you uh you went through the cisco route but you quickly quickly pivot toward software development and network automation so what i guess i know my reason because i needed to survive i you know at the time i was working for a cloud provider and there's no way that we could provision that much stuff but what made you geared toward that because you did it rather quickly it's not like you went 20 years and you know happy with the cli you went really quickly so what happened there uh yeah i mean probably it was quick but um i think i was reflecting on this uh the, the other day uh i still haven't spent quite of time in the networking because uh, i was certified to say when i like certified first time okay cool i probably could do it again it was kind of fun but right. then i when I got the second to say, I was just thinking, okay, but is it worth it? <laughs> Not that I'm undermining the CCA well, you know. Um, yeah. But the difference, I mean, the first to say it was definitely the achievement because a lot of uh, new technologies, uh, I mean, and by I say a lot, I mean really a lot. Um, yeah. And uh, practical cases and all other stuff, the exam itself, especially lab, very complicated and very interesting, very, you know, uh, satisfying when you're saying, yeah, we have passed. But when I'm thinking about the second CC, the difference of the program was just probably like 30, 40%. So it's technically, um, it's good that in sort of like, you know, CapEx in, um, the, um, using the investment you already have done just to get an IC. But internally, I wasn't feeling satisfied anymore because, well, mm. okay, I can go now for security. I just need to learn like certain more stuff or like data center or any, any, any stuff. It's ch- it's really not that much challenging, and uh, at the end, it's not that much challenging. Okay, just to have I'm um, eight times or twenty five times to say what what for, um, and I started looking uh, on the other hand in parallel to this. So my second motivation was even before I started talking about the the automations of toy development was okay. Cisco is great when you're absolutely great, but it's not a single one. Mm-hmm. And uh, whenever you're sticking to the vendor, uh, you either I think became a sort of, um, you know, uh, how would say it, the crusader of this religion, yeah, or yeah. whatever, right? Or you start otherwise to saying that many, many problems, and you start saying it just blaming the vendor. That is bad with the Cisco, this constantly bugs and others. I try not to go into other of the extremes, um, and. Uh, the reality show that's probably, I mean, the my reality, this is the right thing to do because we could see a lot of the networks which are multi-vendor. Yes. When we talk about the big service providers, they would have, for example, Cisco and Nokia, or Juniper and Cisco, or right. Juniper and Nokia. I mean, speaking about service providers, this is really the biggest provider. In Europe, market is different. There is also Huawei, but still yeah. there are only four. Um, right. And uh, when I started like working with these uh, networks and how I started blogging, basically, I originally started my blog on .com, writing about Nokia and Cisco because I was just learning. For me, it was interesting to learn the new things. And uh, I already know Cisco. I was trying to say, okay, how I could expand my knowledge. Technology has the same different syntax. Uh, and then they start for me saying, okay, some vendors not implementing this technology per RFC, so they have some pre RFC, you know. Drafts, and then I started thinking, okay, how, what would be the common base to build the multi-vendor networks? And and the more I started looking into this uh, multi-vendor approach up to the networking itself, like building my multi-vendor uh, mindset, I started looking how I can manage these networks because this yeah. natural step, right? So technology is working, but we have a different CLIs, and then how starting working, okay, how I could uh, probably simplify my job so that I can do the same activity in one device and a second device, not necessarily memorizing all the time their uh, commands. Obviously, the scripting here, the software development, not software development, 
scripting, let's put it this way, is a very <laughs> nice uh, starting point because I could like uh, automate for me some sort of the activities. And then I'm just okay. like, writing this simple script that could help me doing the job. And it was, it was for me, it was, you know, yeah, like completely new world, like, wow. I yeah. can do this. What else I can do? And I gradually, bit by bit, so seeing what else is existing in this world, what are the tools, technology, frameworks, and uh, yeah, with the time I just get to the uh, to the being just doing only automation, only development, only building the things, and looking basically further. Okay, so tools and scripts to deal with the device, fine, but I don't want only this. I want them to take my phone. And just say, make my network ready, and it's going somewhere and doing this some stuff. So how we can get to the point that uh, we can trigger the script also through some sort of the API? So how uh, to simplify further the activity of myself or the activity of my colleagues or the customers, uh, like bringing the automation solution to them, which would be doing the necessary uh, operational activities, which will be doing uh, the necessary like validation and others to help. Uh, customers or myself, the company, if I'm working as employed, to have less outages on the one hand. On the other hand, much quicker delivery of the software and bring new products uh, to the market quicker, what is called, you know, the major marketing buzzwords, time to market, return of investment and other. How we can do all this stuff in the reality, not only talking about that our automation would be uh, making your OPEX 53% uh, low, which I always wonder how vendors calculate this. <laughs> right, that was very exact. <laughs> this is what you see normally on the big vendors presentation. I mean, so they would say right. they ask you to pair Gartner on whatever marketing. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a that was actually a lot um, to unpack there. So the first thing was uh, you were talking about getting CCIE, but the increment, like the first CCIE, it's like your first piece of chocolate. It's so delicious. You take a bite. It's like the best thing in the world. But yeah. the second, um, uh, the second piece of chocolate, the second CCIE, it's like uh, diminishing returns, right? So you, you, the the enjoyment's a little bit less. So what you were talking about was uh, maybe you go into data center, maybe you go into uh, collaboration or whatnot, yeah. and it's only 40 percent more. The fundamental is still the same, so you don't feel as challenging. And therefore, you were looking for new challenges and how uh, how to operate also at the same time in a multi-vendor world where Cisco may not be the only game in town, which is a little different than kind of the environment I grew up in, right? Like, so when I was in network engineering, you know, Cisco was really dominating uh, in the enterprise world for sure, but also a sizable chunk in a service provider as well. But it's kind of it kind of gradually shifted, right? So then there you have more multi-vendor and data center. You know, you have maybe Arista, maybe uh, you know some of the other vendors that are coming in. So I think that's what you were talking about. It's just like yeah. kind of multiple factors. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I, I think it was interesting too because it was uh, like natural again. So with the we're discussing about the curiosity, naturally you're looking. So what else you can do? What you can do differently? Uh, it's I saw a lot of people who know uh, kind of frozen in time. So they're, they're happy, like you're saying, 20 years doing the networking, happy life, everything stable. Um, I sort of think that you you either developing or you are professionally dying. There, there is no middle ground. You cannot be all the time this at the same level of knowledge because if you're on the same level of knowledge, it means genuinely that you're professionally dying because daily the new technologies are coming. Taking about the automation, how many frameworks exist in these days and how many new frameworks come in each and every year, commercial tools or open source things. And I'm just even to see them, I'm not only talking about to put the hands on, which I'm normally very eager to do, to test myself, yeah. to learn the things. You, you you need constantly to keep with this. So you think that you are cool like right now and you don't learn new things, but the next year you're not cool anymore. You're already like uh, outdated. And in a few years, again, it will be just ancient. So I think it's a matter of, you know, also trying to be relevant in this field. Um, yeah, so, you know, like cannibalize your own career kind of a thing because if you don't do it, somebody else is going to come and take away. So you might as well get ahead of the game and um, 
get to the next wave. And I, I, I could identify with what you were saying because I think for a while, you know, um, Cisco wasn't wasn't the innovative leader uh, anymore in the technology world. And you could do a case study on why that was the case. Uh, whatever the reason would be, but my personal feeling at the time was that they were not. So now you have to go into multi-vendor, but you at the same time, you mm -hmm. have different CLI, you have different uh, te technology, you like new features, mm -hmm. but you still have to manage them. And that's what you're talking about. So you yeah. have to find the least common denominator. And obviously they're not going to help you to manage each other. So you need to find um, something that you could build upon. And also it, it, by extension, it gives you the power to innovate. It gives you the power to do a lot more like what you're doing with your phone, uh, calling APIs and and all, all that sort. So um, it's interesting because I could, I could kind of identify with everything you're saying. Um, and it brings back the memories of, you know, why we're doing this and why we go down this path. I want to also talk about your book because we mentioned at the top of the show that you're a uh, an author. And mm -hmm. let me go ahead and, uh, I mean, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll pull up the Anton's book and um, it's Narrow Programmability and Automation Fundamentals. It's by uh, Cisco Press. And I don't know if other people know this, but usually Cisco Press and author by Cisco employees. <laughs> Unless you're, you know, Mr. Jeff Doyle or some other big name uh, that, you know, usually they prefer to, to have authors from, from Cisco. And, um, but you're an exception. So I wanted to dig into that and ask you about what, what was this, um, uh, how did this book came about? I, I read some blog posts on how you, you know, explain how this opportunity came about and so on. Obviously, the forward, but it's more interesting to hear you talk about it. So, you know, okay. how, how, what, what's up? You know, how did you how did you become a Cisco Press author without being a Cisco employee? I, I, I've been sometimes thinking about myself how this had happened and kind of find you know the proper answer for that one. Um, I. <laughs> At that time, so the book, it was taking quite a bit of time to write the book. I was approached uh, by the, uh, one of the project origin, uh, originator, um, Halep, who is uh, mm -hmm. like also one of the co-authors. He, he came up with this idea, and originally he has started working with uh, a few other folks on this book, uh, including the Mr. Jeff Dolan, who you already mentioned, yes. uh, which is also kindly co-authoring with us. And uh, he approached me on the LinkedIn and asked, okay, so we are writing the book. Would you like to take a part? I was thinking, okay, it's something very unexpected. Uh, I was <laughs> blogging, right? So I was blogging a lot for by that yes. time. 2008 was already probably, I was three years just at least professionally blogging in the English, not picking how I was doing it previously in the Russian language. And uh, we said, okay, let's give it a try. So we have a chat with uh, Anna, some other folks, and um, I was, uh, you know, uh, tasked to write. Uh, like some test chapter because writing the book and writing the blog is completely different thing. You also after the book. So you know that it's, it's generally very differing journey because when you write the blog, you just, okay, you have written something, uh, best case you would reread what you have read, uh, you, you have written yourself and then you uh, just publish and on LinkedIn, Twitter, Hey guys, take a look. This <laughs> right. Book is very different. Book is the, uh, like a project of itself. So there is a peer review uh, stage where like some other folks are rereading your blogs, uh, your book, um, your chapter and giving you their uh, comments, which is good, what is not. Um, and then there is a technical review where the people from, um, who are not co-authoring, but who has a certain technology knowledge. And I'm very grateful for our uh, technology reviews with uh, uh, Jeff Tansura. So probably mm -hmm. everyone knows Jeff Tansur. <laughs> and uh, uh, Victor Sucic, who was that time working, uh, when we started writing the book, he was working for Cisco. He probably the only Cisco employee was that time, but now he's working <laughs> for Google. And uh, for they also input for reviewing all the chapters for, for providing a lot of available comment. And then, you know, uh, the rereading of the gram, um, uh, yeah, grammar language, especially for the non-native speakers, it's quite an interesting challenge. So therefore reflecting back, 
I think I was quite lucky that uh, Khaled decided to approach me and suggested me. I was very grateful for this opportunity. And uh, yeah, but on the other way, on the other hand, it was quite a bit of, um, you know, sleepless nights <laughs> and, and days just to write the book in time to, to make sure that we provide all the content and then rereading once more after technical review and then rereading after the review of the um, uh, copywriters, so from the text perspective, and then rereading the feedbacks after the, um, uh, like, proofreaders. It was quite uh, quite an exercise. <laughs> yeah, so you, you kind of... Um... You kind of kiss your family goodbye and say, "Hey, you know, you're not going to see much of me for for a few months, but you know, at the end, this is this is what's going to happen. Um, you know, this this book came about. So, um, you know, there's quite quite a good reviews. Um, I think you know, it's it's one of the few books on uh, network programmability automation uh, for sure. And um, it's kind of silly to think about it, but it is kind of um, nerve-wracking and it, it's something in print right it's almost as if it's irreversible once it's out there you can't just like it, in the blog you can yeah, always yeah. change a word or two like oh oh my god you know i got this wrong so i can go change it but it's like in a book format it's on a bookshelf and people would for better or for worse judge you by it and it's out there and it's really scary but um but like you mentioned right like it's an opportunity that it's interesting and you almost can't turn it down like if it, the opportunity came about you almost just have to go for it, whether you're ready or not. Would you concur or? No, I 100% agree with this. Uh, I think uh, one of the top, I don't remember who exactly was quoted, uh, but probably Sir Richard Branson, probably some others of the uh, you know, famous entrepreneurs. So if the opportunity is popping up, exactly you say, and, and you're not sure you're ready or not, just, just go for it. And then if you go <laughs> along the way. Uh, the same was how the book, I mean, Knowing how complicated it was, whether I would agree up front, I still think I would say yes because, uh, and it's very pleasant to see the nice reviews, as you said. But even if the review had been uh, not that good, still the journey itself was very amazing. And I think it's it's difficult to overestimate how much uh, each of us who was uh, writing this book was uh, uh, learning new content, new technologies, new thinking, new skills, and then put them together. I think one of the famous quotes that I like in this regard from the Albert Einstein, if you cannot explain something, you don't know it. And when you try to explain something in written, so, and, and then you're trying to explain, and you're reading, okay, that's, even I, knowing what I want to say, don't understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> trying to rephrase, to, re to refine, to, okay, add some drawing, add some snippets. It, it's then just coming like into the back of your mind. I mean, everything that was right. Okay, I tend to think if I were like woken up in the middle of the night, I will say, it's, it's a young chart. It's, it's a young structure. In terms of <laughs> <laughs> you wake up in a cold sweat. You're like, oh my God, that, that yes, last exactly. technology was, you know. Um, no, that's a great quote. I think I, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's uh, Einstein may have said that if you can't explain something to an intelligent five-year-old, you probably yeah. don't understand yourself. Or something of that sort, but I think yes. I think you're absolutely right. It's like writing and teaching is twice learning, and it's almost like twice learning extensively. So you do have to, you know, know it inside and out in order to simplify it enough and to express yourself in an organized way. So it's a it's a skill in itself. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm, you know, I think it's a, it's a great book. Um, I've read about a few chapters in. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, look forward to finish that book uh, in its entirety. And Jeff Doyle is actually one of my heroes. Like his writing TCP/IP book was the one that actually got me through the hump. I actually met him in person. I thank him in person, uh, not far from here in Seattle. And uh, so, so it was cool. Maybe one yeah. day you could sign my book too. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, looking forward to. Um... I think Jeff, for uh, as you say, exactly for for a lot of people, uh, the book TCP. I mean, I was using it myself when I was preparing for CC, and I know a lot of people who were preparing but didn't prepare in the end. Still, I mean, was reading this book and kind of uh, digest from it. Despite the book is relatively uh, 
existing on the market. I wouldn't say all that, but I think the book is probably 20 years or 15 years old existing. Uh, the concept, if you take a look on the protocols, OSPF is the first receiver created in 1989, if I don't remember correctly. Um, probably a little bit later, probably 92, but I don't remember. BGP, first release of BGP was in 1989. BGP before 1994. So the technologies that we are using for ages, obviously they're not frozen, they're changing, but the concept, the main general the block, there is there. So for all these books, uh, especially writing to CPAP, they're still relevant and tentatively they will be relevant for quite a while. As long as we are using the BGP, as long as we are using their OSPF or AS2IS, OS, the core functionality, they obviously doesn't contain from the latest things about how to add signature out in TLV or any other fancy stuff. But this is not changing the fundamentals of these uh, protocols and the four fundamentals of these books um, as a, if someone really digests them, I mean, read and do the labs, gives as a value uh, to anyone in the networking uh, engineering area. Yeah, for sure. Like even if, if OSPF wasn't uh, invented till like the 80s, right? Like the Dijkstra algorithm definitely was a lot older than that. So, yes. you know, uh, whatever, like if you go even further down to the fundamentals, the Dijkstra algorithm that's underneath, you know, uh, you know, ISIS and OSPF and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it's if you learn the fundamentals, you can always learn about the adaptation. Just like if you learn about the uh, fundamentals of programming language, then it doesn't really matter where you use Python, you use Golang or JavaScript or whatnot. But just between you and me, you know, Python's the best. <laughs> How, uh, yes, 100%. I do agree that Python is the best. And at the same time, Python was created in 1991. So basically, yes. it is also kind of, not the fresh, not the freshest one, right? Go is created in 2007, I think. So it's yeah. twice, like half the age of the Python. So. Right. It's like Python is the middle-aged, mature gentleman. And uh, Golang is like this young buck that is, you know, just up and coming. And maybe one day you'll overtake. I don't know. But right now, you know, Python is kind of here to stay at least. And, you know, I, I personally am biased. So, you know, I might well, take, take my opinion with a grain of salt. Um, um, I, I think I would agree with you in the sense that I have heard, you know, and read. I, I'm, I always amazed reading some fine heretics like Pipel is dying, so you need to start learning. I don't know, and then you could add your name, Go, Rust, Julia, whatever. So <laughs> probably the same articles was existing ten years ago. If people were staying Python dying, and probably. Um, the language that we were suggested to learn 10 years ago has all of the dead, but Python is still like quite alive. And uh, regarding, uh, re depending on which ladder board you take a look, Python is constantly in top three. It could be either Python is the most popular or the second most popular or the third most popular. And the only competing languages are C, C++, which is also existing for ages and Java, which is also kind of existing with ages. And I think if you take a look on all these three programming languages, they, the reason why they're constantly shuffling because each of them is in different area. So yeah. if you need super high performance, go C++, Not, nothing could beat it. So, and, but the, the cost for that, you need to very well understand uh, the, all the static classes methods, which is Python gives you the dynamic and, and other stuff. On the other hand, if you just want to create some API based application or like CLI based application, probably Python is the way to go. Very easy, uh, very easy to start writing the things. And under the hood, like you see all the like years of C++ with its performance. If you need to have something nice and visual, go Java. And all other kind of language like either part of these merging areas or um, somewhere uh, like in the areas where they already uh, in there. Obviously they might bring something else, but I think the biggest advantage of all these languages of Python or, or Java or uh, C that there are already a lot of libraries existing, the ecosystem is there. When I was starting just my own uh, work with the Python, the first steps, um, I, was, I was using a very nice book. I, I loved it a lot called Learn the Python the Hard Way. Actually, I was advised uh, uh, to start with this book, my my friend uh, Victor Citric, I mentioned earlier, who was our um, technical reviewer, I was asking what you have used to learn. He said, yeah, go for this book. Very interesting book, very tiny. 
I'm sorry, I'm not referring to your book. I don't know you that time. But, but, uh, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so, and uh, the book was very practical oriented. Like each chapter, you, you do some practical things, but very interesting. Doesn't have a lot of, I was, you know, I was looking at the nice big book from the, I think it was a rally, like learning Python, one and a half thousand pages. <laughs> right. Not in the hard way, 300 feet. <laughs> right, well, right. I don't have time for 1,150 1, pages, right? And right. Um, But the, the point why I started with this, whenever I start then, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm normally very impatient in this case. I learned something and I'm trying to bring in, in some, you know, practice, use case to my network device because you uh, learn the Python hard way that doesn't describe anything about the networking at all. It's just the generic Python things. And I was constantly looking, okay, I, I learned what is Python class, okay, or I learned what is the function, how, how could I use it for network automation and all other things. And uh, obviously what you're using, you're using the Google and the Google web or, or other search engine. And where you're landed, Stack Exchange or GitHub. So, and I think from whatever questions I was asking the Stack Exchange ultimately, the GitHub, like how to do this or that and that, with the Python, I was always able to find already an answer. So the learning right. time is much quicker because someone has already asked this or was doing this, which is good because much easier to learn and get the answer. Whereas with the Go, the story is completely different. So it's not that easy to find the, the proper information because the amount of the people who are using Go and who are using the Python just yet right now not comparable. Probably, as you said, at some point, they will be take over. And I don't think it is Python or Go. I think it's important to learn both and understand both. Uh, and probably we could figure out, right? So where, which uh, language more suitable. Um, but from the point uh, of view that Python is one of the most popular and uh, very easy to start and, and get the results done, I think no one could argue with that. <laughs> No, that that's a great point. And um, typically, when people ask me uh, why Python, and of course, you know, uh, Zex, Zex, uh, yeah, Zex's book, "Learn Python the Hard Way," great book. I've went through it myself, uh, cover to cover. And his main philosophy was uh, the hard way is actually the easy way. The hard way was you typing it out, don't copy and paste, and uh, bump your head in the in the wall and make mistakes, do the crash dump. But that is actually the easy way. People think that's the hard way, but that's the easy way because you end up saving more time, have a more thorough understanding. So, uh, yeah. So that's. Uh, but if you're if you're looking for his latest edition, it's actually Learn Python three the hard way because he added. So when I went through it, it was Learn Python the hard way. Uh, but it's Learn Python three hard way now. As you said, Learning Python O'Reilly fifth edition is like a little brick. Um, you could probably yes. kill somebody with it by throwing it at it really hard. Exactly. Like that's just how thick it is. But um, but yeah, you're right. And also, you brought up a good point about popularity. So obviously, we don't just like Python because it's you know mispopular. It's not a you know congeniality test. But being popular means uh, there's a big community. Like the bug fixes gets fixed faster because more people run into it. Um, if you have a certain use cases, that means it's unlikely that you, you're the first one who ran into that case. So like you said, if you go on Stack Overflow, you get answers faster. So it's not that we like it because it's popular. It's because we like it because it has a large user group behind it. And there's a tangible benefit to having many people using it so that it gets answered faster. Doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, easier to learn or, or anything else. It, it is easy to learn, but at the same time, those are what, what we are after. So Anton, I also want to talk about two things. So I want to first talk about all the projects that you're doing, because I know you're working full time. I don't know where you find the time, but if I go on your web page and I'll, I'll include the link in the show notes, which is uh, karniluk.com, K-A-R-N-E-L-I-U-K.com. I find all kinds of stuff there. It's like there's training being offered. You were testing with the uh, Pi SROS and uh, you were doing uh, Batfish, uh, a series of Batfish articles, and you were just blogging like crazy. And here's, you know, like the five year anniversary. Congratulations. So, like, what, what other, like, besides working full time, what other projects are you doing uh, as far as training, as far as 
uh, blogging? Like, what 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 are the out there? I, I think probably just to start with the uh, question uh, that you answer, where do I find it all the time? Besides, like working for time, then doing things. Uh, yeah. The, there is a very nice phrase that I have learned from someone. I don't remember really who. Um, if you find uh, if you like your job is what you like, you're technically not working any day. So it's you for all the time, like hobby or whatever else. And um, for me, I generally like what you are doing, uh, what we are doing, the networking field, the technology field, and and, and I like uh, doing for this. Some time ago, I mean, why in general have started writing the blog? Um, Sometimes, you know, they are, the profession could be very active, like you do a hell amount of the things all together and like you're just in the flow. Sometimes it's you're feeling like you are uh, a stale art entry. No one is calling you. You are still existing, but no one is like, sending any packets to you. I was <laughs> in the career um, in this like stale state where I was employed, I was like doing some job, but neither was challenging uh, nor interesting and uh, as a result was uh, I, I started basically writing because i wanted to do something interesting for myself right. and uh, i just when i started writing okay probably would be something interesting for everyone else and then i started writing the blog because i know when a lot of the doing the things uh, like how our memory is working you will forget about it in some time Right, so that's why why waiting the comments in the code because if you need to even work on your own code in half a year, you can remember what you are doing. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. And then I get uh, to start writing Thompson that would be like a note for myself, even if I need to redo the some stuff. And quite a few times it was really me helping when I was asking by some guys, okay, how we could implement this. Ah, okay, I remember I was like writing about obviously writing and bringing production is different things, but at least right. you know the concept. Right. So originally I was writing about the. Uh, Nokia and Cisco together is how I started writing my blog. How do we do Cisco and Nokia? Cisco is XR specifically and the Nokia SRS doing things all together. When gradually I start writing about automation, start writing more about the automation. Like again, not to forget to create some blogs for myself. So nowadays is a kind of probably the habit that I've uh, worked out over five years. I like writing because it gives me a lot of, uh, you know, genuine interest to learn new things to get to, to the bottom and also to to figure out how that could be um, used to either my full-time job or for for students what i'm doing on the trainings or just for a like, generally for the wider community because um one of the key things when i was uh keeping for myself as a philosophy all the time writing the blogs it's not just to, to write about the technology. Everyone is writing about the technology. Not everyone, a lot of people are writing. Cisco is writing a lot of technology. I always try to bring things into the practical way, how you could benefit from this, how you can uh, take the example of what we are showing and just directly and go and implement it, or at least you understand what particular problem we are trying to solve. With the automation in particular, I impl explicitly was not trying, I still I mean, made some like, generic python how to do this in spot um, but i keep it myself from uh, just uh, writing about the theory because there are already a lot of probably people who are doing better than myself what, what i believe is uh, like a key value what uh, from the my blog i'm delivering um, or from the training to give something is practical for the people to solve the thing and when i'm hearing back that oh cool i have learned your blog a lot of the things so i have just uh, implemented the solution that he was uh, building uh, or have extended it and, and shown how the people has extended to the different layout. It's quite uh, eternally satisfy, uh, satisfied and gives, you know, I wouldn't say sense of purpose, but give uh, more uh, motivation to write faster to do the things. Um, and yeah, so this is the main things uh, why I'm continuing to write and changing constantly the focus like Badfish. I was looking into this. I have still some ideas which I need to write, but my backlog of writing is like, that long <laughs> so, just need to to write about everything that i want but um yeah so so the key idea is that when you start writing this you could find okay uh probably rather than i don't know watching the netflix or whatever i would rather block something because i find it even for myself is quite difficult to even watch it too i'm just getting bored you know so the only way <laughs> I, if I go really to the cinema with my Misses and like we're just uh, like chilling together watching. So, but if it's watching at home, I don't know, boring. I'm, I'm taking the laptop and start like writing or coding or whatever. 
<laughs> okay. So um that's that's funny. Yeah, I like that quote by uh, Mark Twain as well. If you I think uh, it's like if you find a job that you like, then you never worked a day in your life or something like that. Yes, I mean, exactly. I don't know if it's Mark Twain. I, I owe credit to him anyways. Um, <laughs> but but now now I'm jealous of your men- mentality, right? Like I can't sometimes I can't pull away from like a good Netflix uh, series or whatnot. But you, on the other hand, it's like, oh, no, I got to I got to go code. Um, so I, I got to be more like more like Anton, Anton here. Um, just pull myself away from the TV. Think about the time that you could save. Yes, absolutely. And not only about the time. I, I don't think that um, uh, it, it's bad to, to, to watch movie on whatever. I'm not, not saying just go and work 24 by 7. However, <laughs> I like think that I exactly that same time. They just need to work 24 by 7 all the time. You should not like, have the relaxed time. Um, <laughs> it's just more that if you generally like this something you're doing, you know, this one of the different like psychologists, I think, uh, trying to explain this phenomenon something is called flow when you are inside yeah. the flow you don't count the time you just have the things done even you don't not, uh, notice yourself how the things yeah you could spend a lot of the time on that and then like w- when i'm writing things to start creating some new like projects i just wow it's already in the evening i just thought it was like 10 in the morning <laughs> yeah. so we'll walk outside, yeah. so. and i still probably have my like porridge staying somewhere in the uh, you know in the kitchen so that i have <laughs> but uh yeah you, you just don't see this time it's not like you have to force yourself to, to do the things because if you have to force you wouldn't be productive in a long period of time probably short like one two hours but not long period of time and if you could find what is keeping yourself on the flow i think uh there where the magic starts happening, where you start really achieve a lot of the things, but obviously that that require generally be interested in what you are doing and uh, interesting like to do. Like I remember, uh, you know, uh, long ago talking to one of my friends who who was a time a hairdresser, and and he was telling me, I mean, um, I just like the cutting people ha- uh, hairs, and when I learned that I could also get the money out of it, I just was super happy. I mean, so it's like I probably was would be caught in Keith and I was going to get paid for that because I mean. Just, yeah interesting to that it's, i can get paid for it even better then <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah i think that's a good point about um getting into the flow so there's obviously a book uh we'll, we'll, we'll try to include in the show notes as well so it's a book called flow and you often refer to professional uh, athletes saying i'm in the zone right so like that's that's kind of that state that you're referring to as being in the flow you kind of lost track of time you lost track of everything else. You're just so focused on the thing you're doing. And once you find, uh, whether that's cutting hair, like your friend, yeah. or whether that's technology, then you get into that flow. You want to focus 100% of your energy on that flow because you will be successful at it. And uh, whether you get paid or not, hopefully you do. But um, but it's something that um, definitely is worth researching for all of us, You know, finding what, what gets you into that flow what gets you into the zone? And that is ultimately what you want to do uh, for most of your time anyways, and professionally or personally. Um, I also want to you know, talk about your open source projects. So there's actually two, I'm sure there are more, but there's actually two that, um, that you listed on, on your page. One is Hawk, and the other one is uh, the Python binding for GNMI. So yeah. I will let you, you know, pick which one you want to talk first and just kind of an overview in yeah. what the project aims to do. Yeah, absolutely. We could start with the hook. So the idea behind the hook was uh, relatively, uh, I mean, you could say straightforward or practical, but um, I was, so once was doing with uh, some of the colleagues of maintenance. And uh, as a result of the maintenance, so the data center was uh, split into parts which should never happen and like like the, the database the storage was in the one part of the data phase and the application was itself so it was quite uh, impact on the application i mean they were stored and so on but um after that uh event i started thinking okay uh, we could start imposing more uh processes but people are people and people still like with Facebook will find uh, how to check the BGP that the whole internet is going down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So I, I start thinking 
what we can do differently because say i think it's also uh, quoted to the albert einstein right so if you're trying to do the same things and uh, expect them to have different outcome is sort of like synonym of insanity right yeah a definition of insanity absolutely and then okay so what we can start doing different and i start thinking okay how how we can before then doing the maintenance make a check if i'm if we'd like to take this device out or this link out what right. impact it will be uh, on the network i was looking at the bad fish first of first uh, first of all very nice tool but one of the drawbacks of the botfish is that it is not taking the real state of the system. It's taking right. the configuration files and building the model based on that. You can run the test, which is good, but they're, they're not close to reality. What I was thinking, knowing that, you know, in, in the complicated network, on the service providers network, on data centers, big data centers, we might have some links down, like SFP has faulted or switch is taken for maintenance purposes or whatever. And, other engineers not necessarily aware of, of that. How we can take uh, the snapshot of the network and do the necessary analysis. So this was the main motivation behind the hook. And then, and then just spend me probably after the outage a week to get to the stage of the MVP. So how we go into the device, we, we collect the necessary information, uh, for example, state of the interfaces, state of the, it was originally created for the BGP fabric, state of the BGP, uh, state of some other, uh, like, LLDP are the key parameters, and mm -hmm. then build the mass model of the network, something just a simple uh, mass graph, uh, what like OSPF is doing, for example, and the, you mentioned the strict internet algorithm, which is kind of funny because it's what you used in the hook under the knees to, 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 to calculate the path between the endpoints, but uh, relying on what exists in order in the Python. There are a lot of nice libraries which allows you, for example, to build the uh, graph, the, the brilliant library called Network X which yep. is used generally for the network uh all sort not necessarily computer network social network, yeah. people network modeling very nice library and uh some others and, and the idea was okay we just build the endpoints of the data center switches as an attribute of the endpoints we would give for example the uh ip addresses or arc entries connected and then we could model if this device with the existing state of the network with the existing state of the links and the pgp if the device is going down or links going down would I still have the connectivity between the desire? Uh, we define the connectivity rules. For example, all the um, IP addresses connected to the data center leaves or connected to the data center leaves and, for example, to the borders so that we just track connectivity to the default route. Is it still existing or not? And uh, once we are planning some activity, like maintenance job before creating the final schedule, we're just pre-running our assumption against the test. So we say, okay, if this would, would happen, uh, we still have the connectivity, we still have enough traffic and other stuff. And um, yeah, so when I have created, uh, used it multiple times myself, uh, the idea was first just to create the mass analysis and provide the response, okay, not okay, and which combination, uh, or probably even calculate for yourself the combination. So which combination of the spines and like super spines or their borders or lists that we can get out to still have the connectivity. Uh, um, and yeah, after the, after that, uh, we have uh, the uh, the view. Then, uh, when I was trying to explain to some people, uh, like my colleagues, what I'm doing, they say, "Man, but how does it look like?" And then we learned to that. Okay, probably we can draw also for humans uh, the 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 visualization, which is showing how exactly the status is looking right now, or will be looking like if something is happening. Yeah, no, that sounds good. That sounds good. And uh, you mentioned a few libraries like Network X, which is all about edges and nodes, and uh, which you know, like you said, it's not just about computer networks, but it's about social network and like distance from this node to this node and how many edges that you would traverse through and so on. So, um, it, it, am I remembering it correctly that Hawk actually uses async I/O as well? So it's uh, a lot more, you know, asynchronous and so on. Yes, absolutely. The idea that uh, it was originally built for the high scale data center. And sure. uh, when uh, we just starting the job, for example, you have 100 switches. So if you would use a standard synchronous library, whatever it is, uh, 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 Paramico or Scraply or uh, Netmico, which is right wrapper for the Paramico, you would still like go one by one. We can go with the shredding, 
which is kind of would be quicker, but starting creating the application in uh, like 2020, no one there is already asymptote on all other cool stuff. Or 2021, I believe I was creating this year, just to remember when exactly. <laughs> probably, probably I could start doing with something else. And um, as, as we already mentioned a few times earlier today, um, I try to, whenever the project is starting for myself, like when I start writing myself or uh, when I'm bringing uh, e even to the training to my students some technology, um, I have the time uh, thinking how we can do it this time differently. So right. I could have run these trainings. I know how it's working. I'm, I'm not necessarily know in the very like depths how the SNK is working. Probably it's a good opportunity to learn that as well. Right, right. No, absolutely. I think that was what's impressive about this was, you know, not only you're building on, um, a lot of people just put like their interpretation or just change the view, right? Underneath is still very much reusing somebody else. nothing wrong with it you know just reusing some of the existing examples but in this case you actually try to leverage you know python uh, 3.7 and above for the async io and uh integrate that into your uh your tool hawk so so that's that's very cool and uh, like you said you're a curious person so that's a good opportunity to learn um, what about this Just library, to, the Py? On this point, so one of the interesting things, one of the, my uh, colleague has sent me a very interesting uh, blog post, which was posted in the Y Combinator. You know, one Y Combinator is very popular yep. in Silicon Valley for the startup. Yes, sure. And it was quite interesting, art, very long. I was learning, learning, uh, reading it for a few days about, uh, I think it was called something Python, best practicals for the startup owners or something like this. And it was very long article covering 18 rules, how uh, <laughs> you should approach uh, the creating the application of the Django. And one of the interesting things that I have learned uh, in that uh, blog post was your application are living as long as your dependencies are living. Once your dependencies mm. are dying, right? So which is often happening in the, happening in the open source world. A lot yes. of the Python libraries are unfunded. And people are doing on their interest, their free time, unless there is some sponsors behind that, which right. is not quite often. Yeah, it's uh, rare. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in this case, uh, one of the good, like, let's say, strategy to mitigate the risk, you're not entirely avoiding this, but at least you minimize it. You start using the latest libraries because it will they will be existing longer than old libraries. <laughs> Right, right. Same reason you're choosing a uh, long-term supportive version of Linux versus, you know, uh, whatever version that may yeah. not have as much eyeballs, uh, for sure. That's interesting what you mentioned. I'm gonna look that up and uh, see, like the. I, hopefully, you know, I don't, I don't drag myself out down another rabbit hole, but I'll look that up and see the 18 rules. But it makes a lot of sense to me. Your. Uh, you are only as strong as your weakest link. So if your weakest link become is was a uh, a library that no longer maintained or has some security vulnerability, then that's not very good. Uh, makes me very sad. Um, so what about this other project that um, that has uh, you know the Pi GNMI? Like, how did this came about, and what's this what's this for, and why did you create this? So. Also, interesting story about this. So um, we started writing the automation training that, uh, like, which I'm running besides like the, the full time the job, uh, which was originally and still continuing to be a, a multi vendor as well. Like all the things that I'm doing is multi vendor. Sure. And um, the GNMI started getting as a the uh, uh, framework as a protocol popu more popular and pop more popular. Back in 2020, uh, when I started looking what is existing right now in the market, for example, there was a brilliant library for uh, Netcon, which I like a lot, NC Client. Probably everyone is an NC Client if they even don't know about this, because Ansible is an NC Client as well, right? Python is an NC Client. Everything is an NC Client for Netcon. When mm -hmm. I started looking into their uh, JNMI, there was a official binding created by the JNMI themselves. So mm -hmm. the set of the uh, published in the GNMI repository, and basically that is it. There was even mm -hmm. no Cisco GNMI library at that time. Um, and then I'm starting thinking, okay, uh, I try to 
I downloaded all these uh, scripts myself. If you need to run, if you run them locally, you need to tweak them. And we have mm -hmm. them uh, like at the part of the distribution uh, under the hood. But, and I try to bring it to, to the students in the training. So, okay, guys, look, you go to the web page, you download the gRPC uh, 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 bindings for the JNMI. So there is a predefined credit already by uh, JNMI or open config uh, community. Mm -hmm. And then during the like a few months, I think literally no student were able to complete the lab because, and I started thinking, okay, it took myself probably a few weeks just practicing to get up to speed. If you try to learn something, someone else how to use, it's close to impossible if people has uh, originally like no Python skills or even average Python skills because they, this library, they, it is complicated. Yeah. And I started thinking, okay, how, how, how we can start using that? I, I cannot believe that NetConf, okay, I know it's existing already for quite a while, it has nice library, but there is no nice library for the Py for the JNMI. There was right. already that time for the gRPC created by some Nokia folks. Uh, uh, some of them you probably know, like Romando and, and others, who has created JNMI C in, in the Go. It mm -hmm. wasn't the Go, it wasn't the Python. And I right. think, okay, if no one there, probably I will be. So <laughs> was waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. So and I start like writing this project. So what I wanted to have at the end uh, to achieve two goals. First. Like NC client, I was taking this as an example for myself, is implementing in, in the way of object with the methods, all uh, the uh, netconf calls and all the internal parameters. I think in probably I could use the same approach to implement the JNMI specification. So I have right. an object which could be created with a um, uh, like context manager or without, which can work uh, in the same approach, you provide just uh, same uh, simple functions, and also uh, we provide the, the basic parameter. And this, this was first first goal: like have the same experience because I like it and I want to spread it further. And the second uh, point was one of the drawbacks of using NC client directly: you have to deal with a, a XML encoding. So right. obviously there are some third-party libraries you can use uh, to fix it. But what I wanted uh, to have is that as an input to the library, you provide the standard uh, Python data formats like dictionary, list, string, uh, integers, whatever, and you're receiving all of the converted data so mm -hmm. that you are sort of free of burden of doing the conversion yourself. So this was like two ideas when I started creating the JNMI. Some of the things were easy, like uh, implementation of uh, capabilities or get or set. So st let's say the unary request, we just have request response operation was easy. The telemetry thing was a hard nut. I spent quite a bit of time trying just to fix the telemetry because the gRPC itself, because under the hood, uh, um, I decided there is no point to recreate the, the, the underlying transport. There is all of the existing gRPC library created by the Google. I think Google is by far better developers than myself. I don't need to redo their job. But mm -hmm. I could leverage on, on that job. Yeah. And uh, the documentation, how to implement streaming, uh, is very, very, very weak. You can go mm -hmm. and, and read through the whole JRPC page, you wouldn't find the examples. So mm -hmm. just finding bit by bit various things, what I have seen on various forums, even not related to the networking at all, where the people were trying to implement the, the telemetry. So I finally get to the stage of working telemetry. So I was quite happy and proud about this. And the interesting thing was happening afterwards, because I, I the original idea was to create this library to use in my own projects for, for, right. for, for my full-time job or for my students uh, or, or for my like people who are like consulting the private. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started saying that I started getting various feedbacks from various parties. And if you could take a look on the list of the collaborators or contributors, I'm not right. a single one there. So I started saying the need uh, from other people who start also adding, I, I would like to have this feature. And not only having this feature, but also contributing this back. So writing the code and, and uh, pushing the merge request. For me, it was very interesting to learn code of myself. I so far was, uh, by the time I started writing the library, was predominantly writing the code myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Or working with uh, within the team where you have like clear project organized structure. For me, it was very interesting to see how real open source is working. 
where the people yeah. who don't know each other uh, come in with a list. Okay, I would like to add this feature because I've started using this library myself. I'd like to add this one. This is my quote. And then like having a possibility, okay, that okay, someone is start, you know, adding the things to the code they originally created was quite an interesting feeling, I must admit. <laughs> I was quite happy to see that some people were really uh, contributing a lot. I do understand that they have a, a, the pragmatic need as well because one of the contributors, for example, is from Nokia and mm -hmm. uh, he's like pushing this library to be used on this Nokia platform. So mm -hmm. uh, because they have a Python running directly on the box, and it's yeah. convenient to use this library. So this is how this library has, has appeared. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, thankful for all the uh, contributors who are doing this and continues coming with the new ideas and something, because this is basically what is, you know, allowing our library not to get a weak link in other repositories, <laughs> yeah. way around to stay relevant, uh, to add a lot of things. It was also interesting learning curve for myself, not only from the perspective, like being the assert to manage other contributions, a lot of the things like uh, unit testing or yeah. integration testing, which right. is I have seen previously or used myself in a big commercial project, but never have a uh, bring it beforehand into my own projects. Okay, so yeah. how could I optimize my own time and especially that's you know start paying back when others start writing the code? So you're not necessarily understand the. I mean, even if you think you understand the code, there might be something. And rather than uh, being unsure whether I can right now publish or trying to manually test with combination, no, just have a little of the unit test. Unit test. Someone is contributing to code. Fine, I'm just going and like uh, pushing the unit test through that. Yeah, that's uh, congratulations. By the way, I mean it's a big step. Like you, uh, as you mentioned, like for some big companies like Nokia to take dependencies on an open source library that is a huge it's almost like marriage right like you're, you're committed to uh to make sure this this one i mean you know uh, psf has a bunch of sponsors uh you know partly because they're nice but also because they use python and they, they wish to drive the direction of python and then to, to to make sure python doesn't die right because they're depending on it so that's that's interesting and of course you know being a uh uh open source project uh, maintainer that's in itself is a beast uh, like you said you're running unit tests and uh, how to manage people's contribution and how to capture people's enthusiasm that definitely is um is an awesome experience just like book writing and uh and uh other project trainings like you've done so anton you know you're you're a busy guy we're coming up on the hour but you know this has been a really interesting and informative informative conversation in my opinion i certainly learned quite a bit of stuff um but you know the show you know probably has to end at some point but um how to before we go like i want to ask how can people find you how can people follow you on your work what's the best way to follow you know say your training days your blog posts and uh, all the other stuff so uh the best way is obviously to either uh, follow our blog or subscribe to us in the linkedin so either to myself or to the company kernel.com uh, or uh twitter as well we try to uh push all the information that we are doing in there so where we could find all the uh details about the latest post or things that we are working on uh, Time to time, we are posting very often. We are trying to keep the standard cadence at least once, twice per week, doing some content. But uh, sometimes, like when we are extremely busy with some project, there might be pauses. And uh, the the main website for the training is training.cornuk.com, where we are posting new uh, uh, information about the dates and the training proposition themselves. So we are running the trainings uh, like online. Uh, mm -hmm. in the format like self-paced or the live uh, trainings where the people could come and either myself or my colleagues are delivering like in the format pretty much like we're having right now but more obviously uh, with demos and other stuff uh, the new trainings I mean the self-paced could start anytime even today if you like or the proper groups are starting with the live attendance right after the new year uh, we are trying also to talk like when we meet what we start our discussion with on the network, uh, London Network Automation Meetup. We're trying to talk on various events. So recently we're talking in the 
uh, Network London uh, event talking about some other things. So uh, we normally posting about information that on our uh, blog post or in our LinkedIn or Twitter. So where we are presenting so that uh, if you like to join and uh, have like, some conversation, uh, all four, we are doing the things only because we see that still it is relevant or interesting for the people, right? Probably there will be no audience and no feedbacks uh, at, at the same point, probably will be stopped doing the things, but very grateful and probably will take this opportunity to thank, thank you for our readers, for everyone who was supporting or following uh, and is following and was following and will be following us uh, <laughs> for all ideas and all the feedbacks uh, uh, because that's something that we are doing for you and I hope that we will be doing for much longer further. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, you know, so follow him, uh, follow Anton on LinkedIn or Twitter or uh, better yet, you know, go to the website connelluke.com We'll provide the, the links in the show notes, in particular, training.kanelu.com and uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Anton, thanks for being on the show. Thanks a lot, Eric, for having me. It was really a pleasure to have you and hope to see you soon in some further events. Uh, thank you for everyone for watching this video and stay safe, stay healthy. Cold is not yet gone, so take masks. So <laughs> work from home, whatever, just stay safe, folks. Yeah, the public service announcement from uh, Anton right there. And I concur 100%. Well, thanks for listening to the Network Automation Nerds podcast today. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other podcast platforms. Until next time, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.